you, is that a favorite hymn of yours? Yeah, that was done by special request this morning, and the person that requested it couldn't be here this morning, but I think they're, I think they're listening online, so uh, I, I've heard this song since I was a child and loved it, and, but I had a hard time figuring out who Andy was, but here he is, he's with us today, Andy walks with me, and he talks with me. <clears throat> oh, thanks, Andy. <laughs> Well, I hope that you have a, that place where you can get along with God and uh, where you can hear his voice speak to you and you can speak to him. Um, those relations, that relationship with, with Jesus Christ is just, uh, it means everything. And as an act of worship, we just confess to God that we need him. How about if we stand together and we sing to, that, to, the, the, to the Lord this morning, Lord, I need you.
shows up even in the worst of circumstances when uh, we feel down and out we talked about this in our Sunday school class this morning you know the best thing to do is start singing a song of praise just lift up your voice to the Lord give him thanks for what he has done for the good that he's done in first Chronicles 16 we see a, 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 a like a psalm of David he says sing to the Lord all the earth Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name and bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that's in it. Let the fields to be jubilant and everything in them. And let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. The Lord reigns. Amen.
He's good. He's our only hope in this day that we live in. In life and in death, he's our hope.
God, you are our hope, Lord Jesus. Our hope is in you and the blood that was spilled on Calvary's cross. There's no other way to which we can come to the Father except through you. And then we rejoice in that. We sing hallelujah because you are our hope in life and death. Speak to us now through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Glad to have you here at Calvary. My name is Roger Kenyon. I'm the pastor. Paul George is our associate pastor. And uh, we appreciate you worshiping with us this morning. If you've got kids, pre-K through first grade, and they would like to go to Children's Church, Miss Kelsey and Jordan are back there uh, to receive them. Man, you got a football player coming. Just tuck and roll and up and at them. Love it. Church, we're going to be in uh, Acts chapter 11. If you want to turn there, just hold your place. We'll be in Acts chapter 11 in a few minutes. Uh, our main idea, main theme this morning, uh, we've gone through the six different things that the church has said. These are things we're going to do. So we're, we're moving uh, in, a new, in another direction now. We're still in the book of Acts as we were last week. But the main theme is do the next right thing. Make the next right choice. So I'm going to start with a negative example of what not to do. And Eric Shelley gets the credit for this one. You know who I saw this week? Everyone I looked at. Blame Eric. So what's the point? You don't have to repeat everything you hear. <laughs> you got to make good choices in life. And the most important choice you have right now is the next one in front of you. But the passage we're going to look at this morning is going to deal with this idea of if you make a right choice, there will be sometimes ripple effects, small things that will happen because of that choice that are positive. Other times there will be snowball effect, big positive things that happen because of your next right choice. There are other effects that can happen too. They don't have to be positive. If you make the wrong choice, those ripple effects or those snowballs can be negative. So every choice we make has an effect. And we got to make sure we're making the best next choice. And sometimes one small word can change everything. And we have to be open to what God is doing. And so that's what we're going to be thinking about and talking about. Because as the church has developed from the time of Jesus until today, God has consistently done things wrong. From the human perspective. He did things in ways that we wouldn't have done things. He didn't do things in the order that seemed to make sense to mankind. That seemed to make sense to me in a lot of, a lot of cases. There's a lot of things I wouldn't have done the way God did them. And I would have been wrong. Because I'm not God. I'll tell you my own life. If I had written my pathway I would have written it different than God did. But I'm very thankful that he wrote it the way he, he wrote it the way he, what's my English here? Has written it? <laughs> Get the right English in there? Uh, because I think I'm right where he wants me to be. And that's where you want to be, right where God wants you to be, right? And I wouldn't be here had I done it my way instead of his way. And some of those tough choices early on, difficult situations, God was right. And we have to step in faith. And we have to trust God. And we have to make the next right choice. And here in Acts chapter 11, we're going to look at, uh, just briefly in an overview, the, the first part of the chapter, the Apostle Peter teaching uh, the church in Jerusalem about something God did in his life in Joppa. You may remember the, the, the vision Peter had of the, of the animal carcasses coming down on, you know, having the little picnic and... Peter saying, I don't eat none of that stuff. And uh, God saying, hey, if I've made it holy, who are you to tell me it's not? Go ahead and eat. And, you know, after three times of this vision, three people show up and they take him to the man, the, the Gentile man. And, and God's revealing that not only has he saved the Jews, but he's saved, saving the Gentiles to Peter. And this is a big thing. It's a big vision. And it's a really important point in here. And so here in chapter 11, in the first section, that's what we're dealing with is this vision of Peter. But I want you to see a couple of passages to begin to kick this off, to think about what will happen if we make right choices. If we make the next decision well, and we do the next 
right thing. It becomes a snowball effect that we'll see picking up in, in, in verse 19 in a few minutes of what God and only God can do in big ways. But it starts with a small step of obedience. Verse, verse 1, chapter 11. Since the apostles and the brothers and the sisters were throughout, uh, who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. There should be an exclamation point. There should be a hallelujah. There should be a celebration taking place at the end of verse 1. But there's not. Because Peter's still involved in a church that hasn't begun to understand the way God works. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. What was that in verse 1 again? The apostles and the brothers and sisters who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Verse 2, the circumcision party criticized him. There's no hallelujah in between those two. There's no celebration taking place. Because the church doesn't understand God's doing something new. God's doing something different. God's doing something unique. God's doing something that doesn't make sense. And is not the way they thought it should be done. And so instead of joining Peter in a celebration. As the report comes. That not only is God saving the Jews. But he's also saving the Gentiles. They looked at each other and said. Those Gentiles are going to mess up the church. And we can't have that. Peter you need to get your theology straight. That's the response to the miraculous work of God when, he he when they hear that the Gentiles are being saved. How often in our lives do we react similarly when we don't understand what God is doing? How could they possibly get saved if they weren't singing the old hymns? Or preaching out the King James Version of the Bible? Young people, you're just as guilty. How could they possibly worship God if their hands aren't lifted up? i got good news for you. God can be worshipped with hands up or hands down. God can be worshipped in a lot of different ways. But most of us judge the other person's spirituality based on what is our comfort zone. Or what is our desire. Or how God works in our life. And we don't give room for God to do something different. In somebody else's life. And we need to. Because God has been about a development. A change. A growth from the beginning. And it's not going to end. I don't think in heaven it's going to be the same every day. I believe in heaven it will be a constant developing of our relationship with our Father. Which is now perfect. But becoming more perfect if that's even possible. I don't know how that's possible because I don't understand God. But here we start with God's doing some amazing things. And Peter's reporting this. And the church is saying, Peter, you can't talk about that. That ain't the way God works. That's not the way this is. So what did Peter do? He made the next right choice. Instead of getting mad and blowing his top, which is what many of us would do. When we're challenged and we're trying to explain something good and somebody's not taking it the right way. Peter makes a good choice. He explains to him what happened. Hey guys, step back with me in time a little bit. And let me tell you about my trip to Joppa. And while I was in Joppa, I had this vision. And this is what God revealed to me in the vision. And then God affirmed the vision by, by three guys showing up. They took me to this place. And God did this amazing work in the life of the Gentiles. And I began to see that what God has declared clean, I can't call unclean. And so we have to learn to embrace God's work. Even when it doesn't fit our culture. Sometimes our culture needs to change to embrace God's work. And Peter begins to explain to him what's happening and how this is possible. And Peter even says uh, in verse 8, no Lord, nothing ha has done this. I'm not ready for this. I can't make this change. This is too much. Lord, you're asking me to, 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 to turn my back on my heritage. By the way, Jesus is asking us to turn our back on our heritage. And turn our future to Jesus. To God. To His way. Not to the ways of this world. Not to our best thinking. Not to our best understanding. Not to our heart's desire. But He's asking us to turn our heads and our hearts. To our Father who art in heaven. Whose name is holy. 
who's prepared a place for us and a plan, has a plan for us and a plan to prosper us and not to harm us, a plan to move us from where we were to where he would have us to be as he sanctifies us. So we've got to be well, willing and ready to change, to embrace God things, even when it's not comfortable, even when it's not our normal. And Peter said, no, Lord, I'm not going to do this. And God answered in verse 9, what God has made clean, you must not call impure or unclean. And he says it happened three times. Then the brothers came. And in verse 15, he says, as I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them. And just as on us at the beginning. If you go back to Acts chapter 2. You have Pentecost, you have the group of uh, followers of Jesus gathered in an upper room and they've been praying together. And a, a, a wind comes through the windows, through the, through the room, and what looks like tongues of fire came and rested upon each one. And the scripture says, and they began to speak in unknown languages to them. And the people began to hear in their own native languages the truth of the gospel and the presentation that was being given. And they begin to question, are these guys drunk? And they're like, no, it's too early in the morning. They haven't been drinking. What's happening here? And it was a movement, God's movement of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in the apostles, in mankind, as the permanent sealing, S-E-A-L for my bad accent, the permanent sealing of their faith, that they are now a follower of Jesus. And they can't ever deny it and can't ever be denied of, denied of them. And God changed them. And it says that in the preaching of that day, over 5,000, uh, over 3,000 are saved. And they began to, began to be what I talked about last week. They began to be brought into the church where they met daily. And they continued to grow in their faith. And God began to do things in a unique way. Here Peter says, the Spirit of God came upon the Gentiles in the same way He came upon us. Peter made the right choice. He chose to follow Jesus. He chose to accept the word of God, not his history lesson. He chose to accept the revelation of God, not his religious upbringing. He chose to trust that Jesus was at work in others because he saw the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And he made the next right choice. To embrace what only God could do. Even when it meant he was going to face difficulty. Back to verse 1. He shows up. And he says, guys, we ought to be excited. God's doing an amazing work among the Gentiles. Let me tell you how many people are getting saved. And he got the response he was looking for, didn't he? Peter. We got to talk. This is not the way church is done. And Peter made the next right choice. He didn't give up. He expressed to them the vision that God had given him. He expressed to them the experience that he had had. He shared with them the evidence of God's work that says this is real and this is new and something amazing is happening. And we need to be willing to make the next step even though we don't know what's happening. If Peter hadn't spoke up, you know what would have happened? The Spirit of God would have been squelched. It would have been held down. It would have been tamped. God can still do what God can do. And God can work around us if, if He has to. And He will work through us if we let Him. Or He'll work over us if we try to oppose Him. God will still get what God wants. But if we make the next right choice, we might get to be a part of it. We might get to see God doing some amazing things. We might get to see the expression of the Holy Spirit in somebody's life that we thought could it, it could never happen to them or with them. You don't know their background. You don't know their past. You don't know how far from the Lord they are, but I've seen it. And Peter's saying, that's okay. If Jesus can save you, he can save them. And if he can save them, he can save the others. And everybody is eligible for the gift of the Spirit. And that's what he's expressing to the people by standing up for the truth of God. Standing up for his Gentile brothers. Not letting the world take hold or, or, or the church in this case take hold to go down the wrong path. But rather saying this is where we need to be. 
Because this is what God is doing. And he takes it back to God. He's not giving his own opinion here. He's taking it back to God. Verse 17. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us. When we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. How can I possibly hinder God? We need to have our eyes open to see what God's doing. You know God's at work around us. He is. We just need to open our eyes and ears and see God at work. We need to ask God to show us. God, where are you at work around us? And some of you are going to tell me, well, God's not working where I am. And can I just tell you, you're the problem? Mmm, that's not nice, is it? Because God's at work, and if you're not seeing it, and you can't express it, then... You, you, you know why things don't happen around Calvary? There's a big bottleneck downstairs. It's behind Carla's office. There's another little office back there. We call it the pastor's study. There's a bottleneck. Things don't happen because somebody gets in the way. Right? If things aren't happening and God wants things to happen. And you can't see him happening. You need to be asking Lord. Lord am I the problem? Do I need to do something different? Do I need to get out of the way or, or, or get on board? So that you're glorified. Don't let me be the problem Lord. When's the last time you prayed that prayer? Lord, don't let me be the problem. Y'all need to work on your prayer life. I pray that prayer every morning and Allison says amen. <laughs> Lord, don't let me be the problem. Because you know what I find more often than not when I have problems in my life? They start at home. They start right here. Usually because I didn't make the next right choice. Or, or do the right next right thing. But when you do the next right thing, and that's what Peter's doing here, the next right thing. He's explaining what God is doing. And he's changing hearts and mind. And look at verse 18 now. When they heard this, they became silent. I think they were cut to the quick. I think they were having a moment of introspection where they were repenting. When they heard this, they became silent. And they glorified God. I think this is almost instantaneous, but they're two different things. They became silent. They processed what Peter was saying. They got their heart, hearts right with the Lord. And they glorified God saying, so then God has given repentance resulting in life even to the Gentiles. To a Jewish person, that's kind of a slam. Even to the Gentiles. Even to that group. That is dirty, richly unclean, has no history. They have no inheritance. They're not part of the 12 tribes. God doesn't love them the same way he loves us. They've been brought up with all of this thinking. Stinking thinking. And God's changing it. And they get it. And in the moment of silence, I believe they're, what they're doing there is they're, they're gathering that information. Their hearts are being attacked by the gospel through the Holy Spirit. And they're repenting. Because in verse 2, what did they do? They get good news and they criticize. But in 18, they respond. Let me tell you this. If you've been on the wrong side of God, and we all have. Maybe you're on the wrong side of God right now. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to be stuck where you are. You like you, you, probably, you may not like this. I, I love watching the YouTube videos of, of the off-road vehicles. They get stuck in the mud. You know, they get like buried or turned over. And the off-road tow truck has to come and hook up to them and tow them out. Now, I'm, never, I'm not an off-roader. I've never been off-road that, like that in that kind of situation. But they're stuck. You don't have to stay stuck. But to get unstuck, you got to have a little help got to have a little help. The guy shows up in his off-road tow truck. He hooks a strap on. He starts pulling. Next thing you know, they're free. They're loosened up. They're on their way back out. And life is good, but they couldn't do it on their own because they got stuck. But they got stuck and didn't give up. They knew what to do next. And they made the next right choice. Oh, they may get stuck again because a lot of us, you know, we have to relearn things. But they got moving because they made the phone call. 
Oh, so they had to wait a while. It may be hours sometimes for the person there to rescue you. In your life, it may be days, weeks, months that you're in the hole. But if you make the call and give the time and are willing to be helped, God is willing to get you out of the mud. He's willing to get you unstuck. He's willing to get you back on the road. He's willing to teach you and train you new ways of doing things so you don't end up back in the same spot. Verse 2 was criticism over the same statement. In verse 1, Gentiles are getting saved. Well, you can't do that. Then we go through the story and we get, Oh, they were receiving the same Holy Spirit we received. We have the evidence of salvation taking place. God is doing His thing in their lives. And they, and they glorify God saying, God has given repentance even to the ones we thought could never be saved. Even to the Gentiles. And so they're embracing it. Now I want you to see the result of Peter doing the right thing. Because if Peter doesn't do the right thing in the first part of chapter 11. We don't get the first church in Antioch being called Christians. And some of you may be familiar with the story of the first church in Antioch. So let's read it starting in verse 19. We'll go down to verse 26. It says, Now those who have been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because Stephen made their way as far as, because of Stephen, those who are persecuted because of Stephen, made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Oh, that's back to that thing they were talking about. You got two different stories kind of going on uh, at the same time. The information is slow to travel, to get out, whatever. But they're speaking to the Jews. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who had come to Antioch. And they began speaking to the Greeks also. Proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. So now you got Peter teaching the church in Jerusalem that it's okay because God has blessed Gentiles to be saved. We're seeing the results of the Holy Spirit touching their lives and hearts. You've got some who aren't quite ready to make that change. They're not really in touch. It, but you've got some who are now going to the Gentiles and they're making a difference. They're expressing the, the opportunity of salvation to anyone who will listen. And it says the Lord's hand was with them and a large number believed. And news about them reached the church in Jerusalem. Which Peter just talked to about this incident. And they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man. Full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church in tar large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, we like that statement. The, Christians were or the, the, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. We like that, right? Christ followers, or they look like Christ. Now they meant it, the world meant that as an insult. The church accepted it as a praise because we want to look like Jesus, right? So we, we love to talk about them being called Christians at Antioch. But understand, they would have never got to that place of being called Christians at Antioch had Peter not made the first right choice. Had Peter not made the decision to receive the word of God. Had Peter not made the right decision to go with the men uh, in Joppa. Had Peter not made the right decision to, to accept what he saw the Lord doing. And to come back home and tell, talk about it. If Peter had not made the right choice to confront the church with his vision and the, and the truth that God had revealed. And just, he could have cowered. He could, he, he could have given in. He, he could have stepped back. He could have stayed quiet. But he didn't. He made the next right choice. And he was able to convince the church that God was at work. Because of that, when the church scattered to all these parts because of persecution, some hadn't quite got the message yet. They hadn't quite heard the teaching or preaching or accepted what Peter was saying. But some did. Just because everybody's not on the same page doesn't mean you have an excuse not to do the right thing. Some weren't doing the right thing. They were only going to the Jews. Others were doing the right thing and taking the message to anybody who would hear. And as the number 
a people are being saved, they send word back to the home church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the headquarters. It's the home church. It's the sending unit. It's the foundation. Do you think the home church would have received what they were hearing about in Antioch had Peter had already not shown up and told them about Joppa? No. They wouldn't have. They would have been like, they can't be saved. They're a bunch of Gentiles. We ain't sending nobody up there. They're not getting any of our money. That's not our mission field. We're here to take care of the Jews. We'll do that right here in Jerusalem. You leave them alone. But no, when they got the word of what was happening, they sent Barnabas. Why? Because Barnabas's heart had been turned by Peter, by the vision that God had given him, and that, that affirmation of the work of, of God. And so Barnabas is willing to go. The church is willing to send. And by the way, do you think Barnabas was the worst church member in Jerusalem? No. You think Barnabas was a well-respected? By the way, Barnabas was a tithe plus kind of guy. He was. He sold his property and he gave it to the church. We talked about that last week. Or a couple weeks ago. Whenever that was. Barnabas was... You know, a Sunday school teacher, an elder, a deacon. He was, the, he was one of the guys, you know. He was one of the trustworthy ones. He was one of the top. Who'd they send to Antioch? Because when we pastors get together and we start talking about church members who are moving churches, we, we often say, I got a few I'll send you. We're not talking about tithers plus. We're not talking about the, the discipleship leaders. We're not talking about the ones who are getting it right and going on mission. We're talking about knuckleheads. We're, you know, we, we, we say stuff like that jokingly. We maybe shouldn't say stuff like that. But we never give a name to it. Because we're too holy for that. But we're still thinking it right. No they didn't send that person. They sent their very best. They sent the best they had. To Antioch. Why would Barnabas even go to Antioch to hang out with a bunch of Gentile sinners? Because he believed what Peter said when Peter made the first right choice. And it made a difference in Barnabas' life. It made a difference in the church in Jerusalem's life. And so when the church in Jerusalem gets the message they need help, they were willing to help. And they sent their very best. And when Barnabas gets there, he sees amazing things happening. That wouldn't be happening had Peter not done the right thing. And the Lord's hand was with them. And large number believed and turned to the Lord. So much so that Barnabas says, this is, this, is, this is too much for me. I can't handle this. I need some help. Next right choice. Doing the right thing. Barnabas knew when he couldn't do it by himself. He knew when he couldn't handle it. So he did the right thing. You know what he did? He went and found the Apostle Paul over in Tarsus. And he brought him back to Antioch. And Barnabas, who was the leader of the church in Antioch, became the associate pastor to the Apostle Paul. Because he knew he couldn't handle it on his own. And Paul showed up and did the next right thing. And together they ministered in Antioch. To the point to where we see God doing amazing things. In verse 23, when they arrived, they saw the grace of God. He was encouraged. And he encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. Now we're talking about Barnabas here. For he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. There's a lot of good preaching and teaching in the character of Barnabas. But look at the result. Of right choices. In Joppa. It was a salvation. That, that, that multiplied. Into many salvations. Which allowed the story of God's work. To be taken to Jerusalem. That allowed hearts and lives to be changed. So that as people are persecuted. And pushed out. They begin to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. In new locations. In different places. And they begin to build their church groups. Their fellowships. And they need help. So they, they, they send word. And Jerusalem sends Barnabas. 
And great things are happening because people are doing the right things. They're not just sticking with tradition. They're not just doing it the way we've always done it. They're not just embracing any old thing. But with the evidence of the Holy Spirit, with the directing of God, they embrace these things. And what we see is large numbers are coming to Christ. And the teaching that they give them is to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. That's what God's asking from us, isn't it? Remain true to me with a devoted heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And large numbers of people were added. And even in the midst of all the success. There's a lot of success. Barnabas knows he can't do it alone. So he goes to Tarsus. And he finds Paul. And he brings Paul back. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church. So now there's two of them doing the work that one of them couldn't do alone. But now they're doing it together and they're getting it done. A right choice. And the end result of that, they taught large numbers. It's not all about numbers. It should never be about numbers. But numbers represent people. People in church represent life change through Jesus Christ. And it should always be about life change through Jesus Christ. Through lives who are saved. Reborn. Renewed. New opportunities. New hope. In church, that's where we got to be. That's who God's calling us to be. It doesn't mean you can't do some of the same things the same way. You can. But are you open to when God says do something different? Are you open to when God says there might be a new opportunity? Are you open to a life change in somebody's life that's going to be different than you expect it to be? Done in a way that doesn't seem to make sense? When God opens your mind to new possibilities? Wow, I didn't know we could do that. Well, Sometimes we can. As long as we're within the parameters of Scripture. With it, as long as we're, we're, we're being respectful of the things of God. And honoring Him and the things that we're doing. It's not anything goes. It's not everything goes. But it's where God goes. So will I. Who am I to tell God how to do His business? But I am here to say. Lord here I am. Send me. And that means I'll walk in obedience. That means I'll leave Jerusalem if I have to go to Antioch. It means when I get to Antioch, things may be good. But once I'm tapped out, i got to go get the Apostle Paul to come out and help me a little bit. That's okay too. And when he's tapped out, you know, the church in Antioch where they're first called Christians, you know what they do next? They have a, like a business meeting and the church people get together and they're like, you know what, we, we think the gospel needs to go all over Asia Minor. And so uh, Paul and Barnabas... Since you're our very best people, how about we send you? It's not the low hanging, uh, you know, the, the just anybody go. It's if we're going to send, we're going to send our best. If we're going to do, we're going to do our best. And they make the right choice. It's not this is going to hurt us if we do this thing. But it's rather I'm focused on the kingdom of God. And if this is good for the kingdom, then it's good for me. And the next thing they do is they send out Paul and Barnabas on missionary journeys. It's an awesome thing. But you know none of the stuff that happened in Antioch would have happened in Antioch. If Peter hadn't done the right thing to begin with. You're not going to get to the end of your Christian journey where you want to be in the perfect will of God. If you don't make the right decisions now. You'll have regrets along the way. We often suffer from our sinfulness. From our bad decisions along the way. Now God's guaranteed all who believe will go to heaven. Absolutely. Absolutely. But man, wouldn't you like to experience that daily excitement of walking with Jesus? Of being in the perfect will of God? Of seeing people around you's lives transformed and changed by the gospel? It starts with the next right choice. By doing the next right thing. By taking the next step. So what is your next step? What is your next right thing? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? That's the first thing. 
Because if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you're not a believer. You're not, you're not a Christian. You're not a, 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 a sealed by the Holy Spirit member of the eternal family of God. But in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, by faith, you can receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Scripture says that we need to admit that we're sinners. That we need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He lived a perfect human life, even though he was fully God. He died on the cross of Calvary. He rose, rose from the grave on the third day. He is... Our salvation. And by faith we can trust in Jesus and have our sins forgiven. Yes, we need to repent. We need to tell God we're sinners and that we're sorry. And we need to make a commitment to live better. To live for Jesus. Scripture says that if we do that, we'll be saved. We've got to confess Him as Lord. He's now boss of our lives. So the first step, the first decision is are you following Jesus? If you've taken that step, good, we'll go to step two. But if not, would you give your heart to Jesus today? Would you consider starting at that place? Saying, I can't do this on my own. I need Jesus. It's that simple. You don't have to go any further than that. That's your next step. It's the next right thing. To receive Jesus. If you're in Jesus Christ, are you living up to the call he's placed on your life? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you serving in the local church? Are you doing the ministry and mission that God has called you to? Are you growing in your faith? Are you sharing your faith with others? Are you doing all the things that we teach all the time, all year long? I have a feeling some of us are weak in some area. In some part of that, we need to improve. And so maybe we need to get back on, the, on our knees at the altar. Say, Lord, help me do better. Help me make sure I'm doing the next right thing. Some of you don't know what that is yet. So some of you need to be praying, Lord, show me the next right thing. What is my next step? We as a church have to determine what is our next step. What is our next right thing? But individually, we need to pray that prayer also. Because if we want to see what happened in Antioch happen at Calvary, it starts today. And it starts with me. And it starts with you. And it starts with us. And we got to do this together. So as you sit this morning. What is God saying to you? Are you a fellow believer? Do you know Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? If not, would you like to? That's your first step. If you're in Jesus Christ, have you followed in baptism? That might be your next step. Are you in a discipleship group, a Sunday school class? Maybe that's your next step. Are you reading the Bible daily? Maybe that's your next step. Are you praying regularly, daily, throughout the day? Maybe that's your next step. Are you going on mission or ministry? Maybe that's your next step. What is it the Lord is speaking to you today? What do you need to do next to bring God glory in your life? I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to ask Paul and the praise team to come up. They're going to lead us in a song of response. And while we sing, you'll have the opportunity to respond to God. The invitation is pretty simple this morning. What do you need to do next? And are you willing to make that commitment this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word of truth. We thank you for the example that's set in Scripture. I thank you for the failures that we see in Scripture as well as the successes. Because before Peter got it right in this story, he also got it wrong when he denied Christ three times. Lord, thank you for not being done with us yet. But giving us new hope, new opportunities. Thank you for restoration that comes through Jesus Christ. And this morning we come to you confessing that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We confess that Jesus Christ is that Savior. Your only begotten Son who died on the cross of Calvary and rose from the grave. We come to you saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all my unrighteousness, my trespasses. And restore me to holiness through Jesus Christ. Father, help me to know your will for my life, to understand what's next. Forgive me for failures along the way, but now, Lord, we're asking for restoration and hope. Give us understanding so that we can make the next choice well, so we can do the next right thing. Speak to our hearts now, Lord, as we make this commitment to you. Reveal to us what it is we need to do and give us the courage to do it. Father, we ask this not for our glory, but for yours. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing. If you need to respond, I'm here at the front to receive you. Will you stand with us? Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus I come.
your freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to you. 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 of Jesus saying, let the little children come to me. Unless you come like one of these, you got no place in my kingdom. That was a beautiful thing. Amen. And so, uh, thank you. Um, Larry Dahl, still in the hospital. He's uh, had a little trouble getting off of the oxygen. And uh, they probably will be moving him to rehab uh, at Morristown Manor, first of the week, waiting on some insurance paperwork to be done. And so keep Larry in your prayers. The hip replacement went well, but the Coming out of the anesthesia took a little bit longer than normal. Got him stuck on the oxygen. And so now just kind of doing that, uh, building back up and get him to where he can go to rehab. And so keep Larry and Paulie in your prayers. They're, they're both tired. You know how, how much you rest at the hospital. So keep them in your prayers. Um, Shirley, uh, um, thank you. Shirley Jones will be having surgery coming up in October, which is just around the corner. So keep Shirley in, her, in your prayers as well. Um, Diana Martin had a couple of stints put in this week. Diana is one of our homebound older church members. Uh, she also had a, a few, uh, some time back, a stroke in her eye. So she's having vision issues. So they've asked us to also pray for healing of her vision. And so I uh, appreciate your continued prayers for all those who are homebound. But we put, put uh, Diana before you this morning uh, for specific prayer. Um, uh, other prayer requests this morning. The, yeah. <laughs> so 
So a couple of praises. Uh, Jim's brother made it back to Indiana from his stroke and recovery and some of those things. So closer to family and closer to home now. So appreciate your prayers for him. Continue prayers for recovery. Other praises or prayer requests. Okay, so Teresa's Aunt Jean being put on hospice. There she's in Florida. Hmm. Esther's last sister. Okay. Amen. Michael and Josh says you've got your, the best part of your family. Those son-in-laws are great. I'm, I'm just here. Right, Lee? <laughs> Josh, hold up that little fill if you don't mind. This is Madison's baby. So, lots of babies in the Caro family. Brenda. Mm, okay. So Brenda's sister, Sheila, open heart surgery soon. Wally. Melvin Wells, thank you. I knew I had somebody else I was missing off, off the regu the, my, my regular list. Uh, Melvin uh, fell this week. They thought he had broken his hip or, or dislocated or something in the partial hip replacement hip. And uh, that wasn't the case. The x-rays came back okay there, but it is, has loosened up. And so he's in a lot of pain. He is home. But he sees the doctor this week to look at doing a full hip replacement where they did a partial previously. So keep Melvin and Sue in your prayers. Just to, Melvin's in extreme pain from this. Kind of like, you know, we, we watched Larry go through that. And so just please keep him in your prayer. Kevin. Kevin told uh, uh, Becca's dad. or She calls him daddy. Becca's dad. Um, uh, terminal cancer. On the decline, but right now um, still has a, a measure of health and still able to do some things. But just a, it's going to be a journey that we know where it ends. Um, got to visit with him with Kevin this week. And he said he's spiritually he's good, that he understands uh, where he's going and, and where he is. And we thank God for that. But the, the journey's not an easy one to release a loved one. Uh, and so pray for the Toll family, uh, Becca's dad and her mom, the whole family, Becca, as they go through this journey. Got two more over here. Yeah. Be eight. Let's start with Gay and we'll come back. Was it, was it hanging out in Ian or was it Koinonia? What? Well, I preached on Koinonia last week. Oh, man. So you got to go back and watch the sermon. <laughs> it all starts with fellowship, but we want to move it toward Koinonia, which is that love connection that makes it all so special. Okay. All right. Uh, one more. Yes. You too. Okay, so another knee replacement, which reminds me, Jim Bradway is going to be having a knee replacement in October also. And so the joints are getting done this fall. So pray for our people because uh, those are not easy. And uh, so, so keep them in your prayers. Got an opportunity to do the next right thing, to make the next right decision this weekend. On Saturday, we are going to support Emilio on his church plants block party. And so we're going to meet at the church about 10.15. We've got about an hour drive across Indianapolis to get there somewhere around 11.30 and set up. We'll be helping with snow cones, cotton candy, popcorn, and just be in a hand for whatever they need. Loving on the people of the church, Emilio's church and, and the, his uh, supporting church that's over there where they meet each week. It's a Bridgeport Central. 
And so uh, we're leaving about 10, we're going to meet here at the church at 1015. We'll leave as soon as everybody's gathered. If you're going to go with me, I need to know, we'll, be, we'll either be back or leave to come back around 5-ish or when we run out of food. When we run out of food, we're coming home. Um, and so that's Saturday, this Saturday. So if you're available, we'd love to have you. Come and support us. We'll take the church buses and we'll, or vans and we'll, we'll, we'll transport over there. Meet at the church at 1015. But let me know you're coming. That way if you're running late, I don't leave you. I got a habit of I'm ready to go at 1015. And you, know, you might be thinking, well, they're gathered at 1015. I can get there at 1030. Let me know you're coming. Uh, I'd love to know how many we're going to be able to take to do that. Uh, we'll take as many as, as want to come or as few as are able. But... Uh, Pray, ask the Lord, can I be a part of this? Is this something I can do? It, it, you can bring a chair. If you, you know, if it, don't, don't worry about it. I can't stand that long. Just bring a chair. There's something for everybody. And so we'd love to have you come and be a part of that. Uh, as we minister Emilio and his church family and the church that supports him there on the west side, letting them use their facilities. So that's coming up this Saturday. Any other announcements that we need to make before we dismiss? Brenda. Brenda is having women on mission at her house tomorrow at noon. And you need to let Brenda know you're coming. And she can give you more information. No. <laughs> the next right choice. One last and then we got to go. Woohoo. Good job. Congratulations. I'm going to have Paul uh, pray for us as we dismiss. Thanks for being with us this morning. Look forward to seeing you. We have Wednesday night and all the other things going on. Check your bulletins. They're by the front door as you go. Paul, will you, uh, will you pray us out of here? All right. Let's pray. Lord, you're awesome. And sometimes you do things that we least expect in ways that we don't expect. And I pray that we will see where you're at work and get on board with you instead of being stick in the muds. And that uh, we can be excited about where, where you're at work and what you're doing. Uh, help us to see that and to uh, we got this opportunity coming up this weekend to be your hands and feet and um, lips and tongue uh, just to love on people and uh, share what Christ has done for us with them so go with us now and give us your peace there's so many requests this morning I don't remember them all but Lord there's a lot of needs a lot of joints that need to be fixed and so we uh, we pray that you're your healing power upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.